In this video we're going to be installing Atom, the windowed text editor. It's an open source project originally developed by GitHub and it's an excellent text editor for computer science and programming but it's a text editor that you can use for any sort of plain text document as well. So it's handy to have installed regardless of your needs uh, and as I said it's plugin based which is excellent because any functionality that you find lacking within the text editor, you can make a plugin for it yourself, or better yet, someone else probably already has. So within Atom itself, there's an ecosystem of plugins that you can search and install and test them out. So we're going to install this text editor. Uh, we're opening up a browser and going to atom.io, and you'll see a page something like this. And this is the version 1.43 and it's detected our operating system and architecture 64-bit which is good and we're going to download this and see if we can't get this up and running now it is kind of a big download it's 179 megabytes on a fast connection that shouldn't take too long though flash here as soon as it's finished. There we go. We'll execute that. And this is the installer. take a little bit to install. It's going to go ahead and open up as soon as it's done installing. And yeah, we can go ahead and register the default Atom URI handler. That's fine. Yes, always. Okay. And we come to a welcome guide, um, which we're going to close out. This other welcome menu, we don't need the welcome guide, so we're going to uncheck that. Okay. And then close out this welcome guide. And then telemetry consent. So this allows you to the opportunity to make Atom better. It will send anonymous usage statistics to Atom. I like to do that to help them out. But if you're really concerned about security, you don't have to. It is anonymous, but it is still data. So I'm going to click yes. You can choose whichever you like. And this is Atom, a uh, simple text editor. Now I want to open up a, a file browser here and show you something when we go to um, this PC, the C drive, users, my user is just called user. We see, now that we've installed this, a .atom folder. And this is where all the configuration is stored for the Atom browser. All right. Specifically, this config.csan file. All right. So this is really important. And we can actually open that with uh, more apps. We can open that with Atom and we should see it. So this is CSON, it's a data structuring uh, protocol and as you see it's similar to JSON, there's just no curly braces, right? And so you have a key and then a colon and if it's indented that means we have an object and the object is key value pairs. So that's the key and then the value of that key is this, right? So this basically keeps track of all of the settings that we make to Atom. And 
we'll flash back to this as we start adjusting some of our settings. All right. So there are some defaults that I'm going to have you go through and modify because in my personal opinion they should be the default but they are not. Um, but some people find some of these things very useful. I find them frustrating. So we're going to we're going to set it up in this particular way and you can change it as you go along. So we want to go to the settings menu under file settings. There's also a shortcut control comma to get to the settings. So control comma takes us to this settings tab and it opens up in a separate tab and we still have access to our actual config file. So we'll we'll jump back here as we modify some of these settings. Okay. Uh, one of the first things I want to mention here though is when you're editing a text file, I strongly recommend you always make sure that this is set to LF. This is Unix style line endings. In Unix or Linux, Mac OS, the new line character is just one character, it's the line feed. In Windows environments, the new line character is often two characters. It's the carriage return followed by the line feed. Okay, This can cause some problems, especially if you run uh, a text uh, text file as a script okay in a Linux environment so almost universally we want to use the Linux style um, line feed endings okay so whenever you're editing a document always make sure we have the little LF here at the bottom All right so that's the first thing that's the most important thing um, <clears throat> so now let's go into the settings and we want to look at some of the core settings so what we want to change here is close deleted file tab. What this does is if I have a file uh, file tab open like this config.json or better yet I'll just go ahead and uh, make a new file. This is a text document and I can right click and open it with uh, Adam. Just like that. And I'm going to go ahead and check that box. Okay, so now this is my text document. I could type some stuff, new text document.txt, right? And I save that file and that's fine. Now, if I delete this file in my file browser or from my desktop, normally this uh, tab stays here even though the file is gone, which can cause some confusion. So what I just did in the settings is I checked uh, close empty window uh, or uh, close deleted file tabs, right? So when I delete the file, the tab goes away too and we see the tab went away. So that's important just to prevent some confusion. I personally think that should be the default behavior. Um, all right, so let's go to the next thing. We wanna to go to the settings in the editor section. All right, and uh, we wanna find scroll past end, scroll past end. So what this does is, um, let's create that file again. We're gonna have a new file, uh, rich text document. .txt and that's fine and I'm just going to double click it now and open it and if I have some text right and uh, with Adam I can duplicate a line by control shift D which is handy and I can just duplicate this line and we see uh, I have a whole bunch of text here and when I scroll all the way down to the bottom the bottom of the page is here and I can't move this text up any higher because it's at the bottom so with settings, I can scroll past the end of the file. What that allows me to do is now I can scroll, and even though I'm at the end of the file, we see the line numbers have stopped, I can still scroll higher than that, and I can move the text higher up if I want to. This is actually much more useful than you might think. Sometimes when the text is stuck there, it gets in the way of other windows, and it's really nice to be able to move the text that you're looking at anywhere within the text editor. It's a very useful setting, it should probably be default. Uh, the next one, very useful, is show invisibles. Okay, so there are these characters as we have a text document that are invisible. Uh, some of them are the new line spaces or the new line characters, right? And in this case, we have, notice down here, we have the window style line ending set. So we actually see two hidden characters. The carriage return is that little circle star looking thing, and then the line feed character, which looks like um, a reverse L on its side, right? A little line and a little hangy down thing. So these are two characters that are really faint, okay? They're usually invisible characters in the text editor, but Adam allows you to see them and view them. So that's kind of nice. And additionally, if I have indentation, see we can see the individual indentation here that takes place. 
So blank spaces, we see them uh, have an actual um, visual representation, a visual glyph. All right, so this is really handy, especially for coding. If you're coding Python, indentation is key because that's how you designate code blocks. So this is very handy, and they're faint. Some text editor have text editor just have them very bright, and it's it's kind of hard. It's distracting. These are faint enough where you don't even notice them, but if they're there, if you need them. Okay, so that's that's the one. Show invisible. Show invisible characters. Uh, the next one is show indent guide. Okay, so this one is nice. If we go to this new text document. We save this file. Turns out we want to make it a Python file. So I'm going to rename this and I'm going to call it hello.py. Make sure we change that extension. Right? Yes, I want to change it. And we're going to go through here and this is not valid Python. So we're going to select all, control A, backspace, and delete all that. And we're going to make a nice simple Python program. Okay, so if true, we're going to indent and print true and then if false we're going to print never All right so now we see we have indentation we see the invisible characters that's nice but we also have these indentation guides that let us know what level of indentation we're at. Here we have two levels of indentation and it should very sh uh, clearly shows us that which is very handy specifically for Python. All right, And it looks like our indentation it by default is set at uh, four characters. Right? And I can't move this cursor in between. Right, So it is actually typing a tab character here even though it shows it as four uh, individual um, invisible characters. All right, so I'll save that and that's fine, but we we get the indent guide, which is the key key takeaway from that. Okay, um, what else do we want? We want uh, soft wrap. Okay, soft wrap basically allows us to wrap the text. So if I have a long um, piece of code, and generally speaking, you don't want really long lines of code, uh, but sometimes comments are one thing that. Uh, become very long lines of code. So here is a long Python 3 comment. And I'm going to make it even longer by copying and pasting it a bunch of times. Now the default behavior here is to create a horizontal scroll bar and we see if I actually need to read this and I'm going through my code it's really a pain to have to come down here and read it like that. So what soft wrap does is if the line itself is longer than the viewable window, it automatically wraps it underneath. Okay. So when I click the setting soft wrap, go back to our file, we see that it's it's wrapped directly underneath the same indentation where it started, right? And notice we don't see the invisible characters here, right? Because there are none. This is just a soft wrap. There's not actually invisible characters here. Additionally, our line numbers here we see that this starts on line 5, but when we get down here, this we don't have additional line numbers because there really aren't additional line numbers. This is the only uh, new line character, right? It's a carriage return followed by a line feed. So this is where line 5 actually ends, and then we go to line 6. Okay, So this is part of where invisibles and indent guides uh, all help out a little bit, understanding exactly what's going on in your text file. Okay, So that's soft wrap, very nice. I think it should probably be default. Um, one thing we want to uh, check with soft, soft wrap, I like to have a hanging indent. Okay, so the hanging indent by default is zero. I like to make it two. What that does is we go back in this file. Instead of the text being exactly underneath where it was on the line that it started, we're going to indent it just by two, just a little bit. And so we know that this is all part of one line. Visually, it just kind of helps. That's a preference thing. All right, and then um, what else? We need tabs length. So number of tabs, number of spaces used to represent a tab. Uh, personally, uh, especially for beginners, I like four. I think four is just more visually pleasing too. You can get kind of lost uh, if the indent style is just two, especially if there's a lot going on in the code. So four I think is a little bit um, cleaner uh, and more visually appealing, but that's a preference thing and there's lots of opinions on that. So if I set that to four, 
we see the indent guide is still four. Let's set it back to, let's make it eight or something. Let's save that and see if Oh, I'm not sure why I didn't change that. But at any rate, we want this to be 4. Uh, it normally, in other files, it, it should have an effect. Some files have their own independent tab length settings. Um, so we might be, this might be over overridden by another Python package or something like that. But this makes it um, the general default if something else doesn't override it. So that's tab length of 3. Uh, tab type, um, what we want is soft right um, soft tabs so soft tabs are spaces if we set tabs to soft save this we can unindent right and then I'll indent that that to line feeds so when I change that to line feeds notice all the carriage returns once went away that's that's nice um, these are still tabs so I do think there is a, a Python file setting that's overriding this so let's try a different file we'll make a JS file and see if, if that helps text document hello.js Adam. Okay, so I hit tab and oh, it's still using tab characters, it looks like. Better not save that setting. Soft tabs. Soft tabs, soft tabs is correct. tab type. Usually auto should be fine. It, auto basically automatically detects um, the tab settings you have in the file so whatever tabs were being used it's going to use those. So auto is generally what you want. So we'll leave that alone and I'll try to come back uh, and figure out what's going on with that at a later time. All right, but it is showing the invisible so perhaps um, perhaps it is working. It's just behaving differently than it used to. All right, um, so that's one tab length four, and then now now we go to packages, right? So we go to settings, and we've gone through core and editor, and now we want um, packages. So there's by default initial packages that are installed that have some additional settings. Okay, one of the things that's frustrating to me is uh, the idea of a bracket matcher. Uh, so bracket ma matcher basically when I go to print something. Here, for example, I go print and I type a left parenthesis, it automatically creates the right parenthesis and then puts the cursor in the middle. That's nice for when you're typing clean code, but a lot of the time when you're working, um, you are editing code, right? And so that can get frustrating when you, you know, type uh, left parentheses and you always have a right one. So when you're starting from scratch, it's kind of nice, but normally I find it just gets in the way more than anything. So I'm going to disable this, and that comes from a package by default. And this package is called Bracket Matcher. Okay, so I want to click on Packages and search for Bracket Matcher. And it shows up here, Bracket Matcher. We go to Settings, okay, and Autocomplete Brackets. Okay, I don't like that one. All right. And then the next one is white space. So we're going to go back to packages and search for white space package. And we have settings. And basically what this does, the white space package is kind of handy because say we're back at our Python file and if I have a bunch of blank space at the end of this line, when I whenever I save the file, it will scan for additional white space and remove it. So I I click save. No, it's not doing that one either. Interesting. 
oh, that is because my cursor was on that line. So I click save and it removes the line. It also removes the white space, the new line characters at the end, right? So I click save and it deletes all of those. Now this is exactly uh, the part, oops, this is actually the part that we're changing here. In settings, by default, if, I, if my cursor is on the line with the white space, it does not remove the white space for some reason. And it can be very confusing, as you just saw, I was confused by it, even though that's the setting I'm changing. So uh, ignore white space on current line. I want to uncheck that, so that way it's always going to have consistent behavior no matter where my cursor is. Right? So if I go and I save this file, control S, it's going to wipe out all that additional white space. We, we never need additional white space at the end of a line, right? and we never need more than one new line character at the end of the file. So it always adds just the one new line character and no white space after that. Okay? So that's the change we want to make to the white space package. And then there's one more package, autocomplete plus. settings and what we want to look for here is autocomplete is a feature that it basically looks at the code you've already typed and it tries to guess what you're trying to type right so if I have a function do something cool and return x plus one a simple function and then later down here I want to call that function so I start saying D O S and it's making a suggestion is this what you want right or if I type P R I is print the function you're trying to use right but it gives you some options and it comes up with this menu right so if I hit escape that menu will go away but if I type three characters by default it will uh, bring up this menu so what I want to change the setting to is tab always selects the item in the list and enter when you have specifically gone down in the list to select it. All right. So if I type So the reason I do this is you might want to press tab uh, or enter so say I, I want the keyword prin and I want to just press enter. So I do want to go to a new line there, right? I don't want the print command, right? PRI in. By default, if I press enter here, it would select this one and that can get very frustrating. So if it's the first one, the way I select it is I press the tab character and it will auto complete that one. Do something and if I hit tab and it's the first one, that's fine. If I actually have to go into the menu down here, then I have to press enter in order for it to select that one. Okay, But if it's the first one and it's making suggestions, the only way for me to select that first one is to hit tab. If I hit enter, it will not select it. It will actually add a new line. So after working with that for quite some time, it was very frustrating until I found that setting. So tab always and enter when suggestion explicitly selected from the menu. All right. So that does it for the basic settings and the pre-installed packages. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're just going to install some additional packages to give us some extra uh, extra functionality into this editor. Okay. So to install additional packages, you can click install and search for the package, right? So one package is open terminal open terminal, uh, one terminal here, the one that I use, and lots of times there's different variations of the same kind of package. Open terminal here, it's had the most downloads, it's got a high version, so generally speaking that speaks well of a program if it has a lot of, uh, or of a plugin if it has a lot of downloads. So we're going to install this one, and this is the one I normally install. When we install this, we're going to get extra functionality. All right, so it's installed now, and over here on the left, this is our desktop, and we can create folders and files here, but now, since we've installed Open Terminal here, I can right-click anywhere, and we should have this Open Terminal, and it opens a terminal directly at that location in your file system, in your project. So this is a handy one to have. 
that's open terminal here. Um, any type of language you want to use that's not installed but by default usually starts with the keyword language. So we're going to install another package called language JSON5. Right? And that has support for the language JSON5, which is pretty much just like JSON, except it's more like JavaScript and allows you to have comments. It's everything you want JSON to be, but it isn't. So JSON5 is a really nice um, protocol, and we want Python or uh, Atom to be able to understand JSON5. So when we install this, it should. Okay, any other languages you might want to install? Uh, most of the time they're going to start with language hyphen and then the name of the language. All right, so language JSON is installed. We're going to install another nice one that's file icons. And file icons. Okay, so notice this one has 7 million downloads versus these other ones and they're similarly named and they might be fine. They have a lot of downloads too. Um, but this is the one that I'm used to, so I'm going to install this one. And when this installs, we're going to see over here, all of these files, they just have a generic icon right now. File icons will look at the extension on the file and give it the appropriate icon. So you can visually just look and determine which file you have uh, rather quickly. All right, so here we have a JS file, and it gives the JS icon, Python file, Python icon, right? So this is really nice. Um, let's see what else do we have. Um, we might need to change the permissions specifically if you're used to a Linux environment. Um, it's not quite as useful on Windows, but I use Linux most of the time. So we have the schmod package. This al allows us to set the file permissions. So I can install this. And similarly, once this is installed, I can right click on a file and change the uh, permissions of that particular file. That install. Okay, there it is, and I can right click now and change mode. And you can set the mode uh, like 755, change mode. This would be normally 755, something like that. So you'd have to know what schmod is, and you can read up on that on your own. Um, Pigments is a really nice one. What Pigments does is let's open an HTML file, new text document, and I'm going to rename this test.html. So this is an HTML document, and uh, Python ha or Atom has some snippets built in. If I just type HTML and hit tab, it automatically generates a basic HTML jo document for me, which is kind of nice. I don't have to type all this in. Um, if you make a whole lot of simple HTML documents, which I do, it's pretty handy. Okay, so what we're going to do here is in the head, we're going to make our uh, style tag and show you what pigments does. Pigments basically allows you to see the color uh, when you're using a hex format uh, to generate your color. So the hex format is two hexadecimal characters of red and two hexadecimal characters of green, two hexadecimal characters of blue. All right, so in the style tag, we might say in uh, the body element, we want the text color and we want to specify um, red, green, and blue properties. So hex characters, that could be, say we want um, just a little bit of red, and we want uh, a lot of green, so that might be C, and then uh, just a little bit of blue, something like that. So what Pigments does is once it's installed, it will scan that and then actually display that color that that represents. If I change this around, let's, let's move the 7-7, um, seven, seven. so the green is now 7 and the blue is C, right? So it gives you the color visually within the editor without uh, any other fuss. So that's that's a really handy one if you do anything with um, anything visual, anything with colors, hexadecimal based colors, right? So that's nice. Go back to settings. Um, what are the ones do we have? Uh, pretty JSON. 
this one just makes JSON a little bit more read readable. We can install that. Uh, we also have tree view auto resize. So this is the tree view and look how much space we have. I can manually move this around but it's kind of a pain. So tree view auto resize. Auto resize. This one here, 17,000 downloads. Install that and we'll see once that installs it'll automatically collapse down to the longest edge of text here. And generally speaking, that's what you want anyway. Okay, see, and it installed and now it shrank down. So as I add items and the length of these items get bigger, it'll automatically resize. That's nice. Uh, another thing we need is the minimap. The minimap is very nice. We have a text file here. And let's say we have a whole bunch of code. Let's go ahead and just copy and paste this. And we have just a whole bunch of code in this file. And I scroll up, and it's kind of hard to tell where I am. I might have a comment block here that's easy to see uh, as I scan through. All right, so here's a bunch of comments. Now over here, this is the minimap. It just installed, and after it installed, we can see it. It's a smaller representation of all of the code in your file. So you can scan through your file over here and drag, and it'll scroll to the appropriate place. So Minimap is very useful. Highly recommend it. Um, and it is a package by itself, and there's additional functionality you can add to it. Uh, OK. We also need the linter, the linter package. So install that. The linter uh, scans your code, depending on what language you're using, and it will scan it and determine if you are using, first of all, legal syntax, and second of all, it can scan for style. So there are some preferences people have of particular styles you use when you're coding. Um, there are best practices that uh, most people agree on, and then there are other things that are just kind of style and different groups feel different ways about it. But you can configure that style however you want. What the linter does will enforce that. So as you type, you will get indications as to whether your code is, is incorrect and that will help you especially if you're a beginner coding um, but professionals use linters all the time as well so it's a really good habit to get into so you have to install linter and then you install the language uh, what linter you actually want to use so for example for python if i want to use the linter pyflakes first i have to have already installed pyflakes i can open up a terminal and run pip3 pyflakes that or pip3 install pyflakes like that I've already installed it but it will go ahead and scan it says requirement already satisfied but this would have installed pyflakes since it's installed now I can hook that up to Adam with linter hyphen pyflakes so now this will run Pyflakes on my code and display any errors in the file. So once this runs, we can go back to my Python file, and oftentimes I have to uh, close the file and open it back up for the linter to scan. Let's see if we can get it to do anything. We can close Atom and open it again. Sometimes you have to do that. There we go. So it needs to install this dependency. Yes, we want to install that. Okay, finished. Now there's a couple other dependencies, yes. There it goes installed. We'll go ahead and close it and open it back up just to make sure. 
Now when we go back to our, notice when I open it back up, all of the files that I previously had open are open still, which is, that's really nice. If your computer shuts down for whatever reason, you still, everything opens up exactly where it was, even if you hadn't saved your file yet, which is really nice. <clears throat> okay, so here we see uh, the linter in action. All right, we've got some issues here. <clears throat> so I redefined this uh, function twice, and it's saying that's an issue, right? That is an issue. You're not supposed to redefine the same function twice, right? So little things like that, it will tell you. This is just a warning. It won't break my program, but the, the red ones, if you get a red ones, that's a definite error. All right, so that's what a linter does. And we're going to install a couple linters for various programming languages here. So we go to settings. We did linter pyflakes. Um, for uh, JavaScript, we want uh, linter eslint. Right? And for that one, we want to make sure we have eslint installed. So we use npm, which is the node package manager for Node.js. And we were going to want to install globally eslint. We have to install the linter in order for it to be uh, used on the code. It's installed and so now this linter will help us with our JavaScript so this is still installing So now we can click on JavaScript and console.log. And I might have to close it again. But normally it would complain because I left a, a semicolon off there, that sort of thing. All right, so that's what the linters do. Um, we'll install a couple more. For web programming, you're going to need. Uh, cascading style sheets, a CSS linter. Um, install that one. We're going to want HTML linter. HTML lint, I think, is the one I used. But it looks like linter HTML hint uh, it seems to have many more down downloads. So I'm going to try that one this time, HTML hint. And then linter shell check. And this, if you do any shell programming, bash scripting, or anything like that, this one is helpful. All right, we're almost done. There's a couple more things we need to add to the minimap. One of the things is minimap linter. That will show any linter problems in the minimap as well. Okay, so let's go to minimap linter, if I can spell it. Install that. Right, now when we go to Python and we see this issue here in the minimap now, it should show up here in a second. We might have to close and reopen it. Yeah, so anywhere there is a linter issue, where this dot is in the file, it highlights it. So these are all warnings. They're yellow, and if they're red, they'll show up. So this is kind of nice. You can visually see where all the problems in, are in your code. All right, minimap linter, and then we need minimap find and replace. What this does is when you find and replace in here, control F opens the find menu in Python. It's really nice. I want to look for uh, the word something. Right? I want to make that search case sensitive. Right, and I want to replace that 
uh, with nothing. Okay. So if I click find, it goes through and finds all of these. If I click replace, it will replace something with nothing down here. Right? What this setting does is it shows all of those in the file itself. Okay, so if I close this and open it, it will show all those in the mini map. So if I go to find and I go to find them, I might have to close the file. Oh, it's it's in the same line here as the um, as the linter error, so I might have to do something like this. Save it. And we'll close and open it. Let's see if it registers now. So we want to find something. And it should show us that. It's not doing that right now, but I'll have to look into that. Uh, and then what else do we need? Minimap, um, current selection. This displays what you've got highlighted and minimap pigments. If you have any pigments installed, if you have pigments installed, this will show those pigments on the minimap as well. And that's it for these additional packages. There are numerous other packages. There's lots of different tools that are going to be very useful. Feel free to install some and explore some. Uh, periodically as Adam updates, you see some of those packages didn't quite work um, the way they had previously had for me. Um, so sometimes those packages need updated and that's a good opportunity to try out some other packages sometimes. Okay. So this is the basics of installing Atom and getting familiar uh, with its settings. And as we go back here to this config.cson, everything we did, all the settings we made, modified this config.cson. And this is all of our settings. Okay. So that's Atom in a nutshell, and we'll do another video on some of the shortcuts and how to get around a little bit better.